systems as an intro. So we were just going to uh, run through in our uh, reprise uh, the uh, wheelbase systems to start with. So fairly obvious stuff this, but we always like to pitch things at more at a beginner level so that if somebody's site logged in that's relatively new, they may not know about some of this stuff. So on the left, you've got a regular six inch bench grinder, which is what most people um, start off with because they think that by spending 60 or 70 quid on a bench grinder, uh, that that's the way to go um, because it's cheap. Um, which it is possibly the cheapest way of doing it if you can learn how to hand grind. Um, then you can get in the middle a bigger version, uh, eight inches, as we all know. Uh, you move away from uh, the cheapest ones have come with gray wheels, then you go for white wheels, um, and then you can go to CBN. So uh, Simon Hope, for instance, sells an eight inch bench grinder with a nice 40 mil white wheel on the left and a CBN on the right. And that's a half speed one at 1400 RPM, like the middle one on there is, which is a bit slower, a bit better for grinding than um, more for sharpening than grinding. Uh, and that's 350 quid. So, um, yeah, I always try and have this conversation with the beginner when they say, which system should I start with? And the answer is, well, choose a piece of string. Um, mm -hmm. So just a couple of comments about fast wheel grinding. Most grinders, as we know, spin at about 2,800, 2,900 RPM because they're designed for grinding, not sharpening. Uh, there are a number of them that seem to be twice the price for half the speed uh, that are what they call slow, but they're not slow, they're slower grinders um, that still grind, but slower means that they're closer to sharpening. Uh, at about 1700 RPM. I've only used one of them a couple of times. I'm not sure I noticed a massive difference in, in their uh, functionality, but um, the whole point about uh, using a fast wheel is that they will tend to eat up the metal and they can heat up the um, tip, which is only really a problem if you're sharpening carbon uh, uh, steel. If you're sharpening high-speed steel, it's rare that you can, I don't think it's possible unless it glows to red heat to actually um, reduce the harden, uh, hardening of the tip by bluing it. If you do blue a high-speed steel one, it's not good practice, but it won't knacker it. If you blue a carbon one, then all of the strength in that area is gone. So that's why we don't use 20 millimeter gray coarse wheels that come with them. Excellent for grinding bolts. Uh, it's always good to have one in the workshop. But that's about it. If you're using high speed steel, traditionally, um, aluminium oxide is what's provided as the norm, white, 80 or 120 grit. But ruby, uh, which has got more chromium oxide in it, it's more difficult to find now. Uh, so because nowadays people migrate from a white wheel, usually to CBN, uh, I would say. Um, uh, you can get ruby wheels, but I can't easily find them more than quite narrow. Finding 40 mil wide white ones is a bit tricky. Uh, don't forget, you need to true your wheels up if they're not CBNs um, regularly because you get a furrow otherwise. <clears throat> I'm not a great user. I've never used CBN, so I won't try and talk about that very much. But they are the bee's knees. They run cool and you don't need to true them up. But there's a cost involved. Uh, and just a point, a reminder that I often have people come to my workshop and say, can I grind my tool on your uh, Pro Edge? I said, well, you can, uh, but it'll take me half an hour to get rid of the um, hollow ground on your a tool that's come from a six inch wheel. So uh, just it's all about matching your wheels to the radius of the grind. More important on a flat, on a skew, um, not the mathematics of a, of a hollow ground on a short bevel on a, sk a spindle gouge is such that there's not that much difference, but there is quite a difference when it's on a flat grind of a large bevel of a skew.
So quick bit about jig systems. Uh, each one of these is featured somewhere in the session today. Wolverine is the first because Wolverine or Wolverine knockoffs are, I think, the most common jig system that people gravitate to when they buy a jig. On the bottom right, there are various versions of eBay, blacksmith uh, made uh, ones, and there are various variants of that from half of the system from, for 35 quid to all three parts of it for 95. Axminster make the, the one-way Wolverine UK knockoff version. There aren't very many that I can find of one-way stockists of the true Wolverine system left in this country now that Toolpost has gone. I'm not sure who does it. Um, uh, Viv will talk briefly uh, about the Wolverine system in her presentation. No, uh, I mean Shirley. Well, I'm sorry, but Shirley. Shirley. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, <laughs> you've got How a spoke. Can... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Simon Hope is the new dealer for um, one-way equipment, including the Wolverine. Oh, I know he's one-way, but I didn't see the Wolverine. I did have a hunt, but thank you. That's great. Um, and I haven't yet seen the Wolverine Very Grind 2 yet in this country. Um, and that's the middle one, which is an add-on um, a variant for the way that the jig uh, is held in the cup, <clears throat> which maybe, Shirley, you want to talk about a bit at some point. Uh, but it seems to be that if you buy it as an add-on, it's about another 120 quid. Uh, and it, it just stops that uh, jig popping out of the cup when you do the, uh, the grinding. I think if I was having the Wolverine again, I'd probably go for that. I had one of these as a knockoff yeah. to start with. Couldn't get on with it because the spoke mm -hmm. got in the way. Yeah, uh, I think I'd go for the very grind too as well, actually, Mel. Yeah. But I didn't get on with it. It ground well, but the spoke got in the way. It, every time I walked past, it took my bloody hip out. So that went yep. in the bin. Mm -hmm. um, the Woodcut True Grind, um, it, it's a similar principle for the, the jig of a wobbly, wishy-washy, flat side-to-side job to do your spindle grinds. Um, but it has a cassette and goes in and out. It's more compact. Um, I still think there's some design faults with the cup. Uh, I don't know whether there's another variant where the uh, jig sits into a bigger cup, but you need, you develop the technique, you, uh, which Simon will talk about briefly, um, but it does tend to flap about a bit. Um, but it's compact uh, and it's only 160 quid in inverted commas. Uh, and you can get two cassettes, one for each wheel if you want, um, or just have the one. Uh, when people ask me what would you go for if I if I've already bought a grinding wheel, I tend to aim them at that simply because it's more compact and most people's workshops are quite small. Um, then you've got the Sorby Universal, my uh, second grinding system, sharpening system, which I still have and loathe. Um, that uh, we'll come to. That's a, a little system there. Where it's all in a sort of a jig system in a frame, and it all sits compactly. Uh, you don't see many of those around now. Um, I think they're probably less popular, in my view. Um, you can make your own uh, wibbly wobbly jig for your spindle gouge. Uh, <clears throat> I've made one, uh, and I've made uh, a Wolverine-style wooden plywood runner for it to work in. Unfortunately, I can't get photographs because it's locked up in the National Trust workshop. And I made it for the National Trust where I volunteer uh, at Hewenden. Uh, but um, there's a, uh, you know, it's quite well known. The bloke's had several hundred thousand hits on his YouTube. Uh, that, not too bad. My carpentry skills are rubbish, but it's easy to make. Um, then you've got the wet stone systems, which Viv will run through. Um, and it's interesting, the range of prices. Uh, I'm not commending any of these. It's just a statement of where things are. The record power system seems to run at around 300 with the wood turners jig system. They all run on a shaft that sits over the top or, or and or over the front, depending upon the version that you've got, which allows you to slide your jigs on, uh, which allows you to then do your sharpening. Uh, the Tormek Mega, Mega Dog Cajoni system. Well, actually, no, at 1100 quid, that's your starter, <coughs> sir, because what you really need is the Tormek proprietary um, stand for it to go on. And that's only 500 quid for you to make it look really nice in your workshop. So, um, yeah, I expect some people love it so much that they're worth paying for the full system. Tormek, of course, have smaller systems that range between the two. 
then you get Linishes. Uh, you've got the Sorby Pro Edge, which we'll discuss <laughs> at various times later on. Um, uh, and uh, similar, you need a platen for uh, straight across grinds, and you need a jiggy thing to do your wishy um, Ellsworthy type grinds. And then there's the new ball on the block, the Axmith's Ultimate Edge Linisher, um, which is a bargain price of 480 quid. And you think that's absolutely wonderful. Do you realize you've got to spend 300 quid to buy a full set of Tormek jigs? Um, it works very well if what you have is a Tormek for, say, sharpening your plane blades, uh, but you uh, maybe want to buy something else. I've done a review of that. So I borrowed one from Axminster. So that's a quick roundup of your costs. Um, and you can start 165 quid and end up at 1100 quid. And somewhere in there, there's a sweet spot for most people. I'm not exactly sure what it is, uh, but we'll see what you think later on. Right. This is my bit. Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank goodness for that. Right. <laughs> That's a good start then. Right. So I've got, um, as Malcolm said, I've got Wolverine. So I've got um, Einhell Grinder. So that's all the specifications of it. Very boring. Um, but I thought I'd put it there in case anybody was interested. Um, that's what it looks like in reality. What you get in the kit is basically this bit here and this bit here. And you have to um, pull the bar in and out in order to set the, um, the skew or the roughing gouge or whatever into the, um, onto the grinder, okay? Uh, that's my, I mean, you have to find, make sure you get the stone on the bevel in order before you start so you can grind the whole bevel. And I normally stick a, um, um, a fibre tip on the thing to make sure and then just do it by hand just to make sure that it's, it rubs it all off in all over the bevel. Okay, so here's my video of resting gouge. I have to excuse this video. I'm afraid for some reason my camera went into slow-mo halfway through this. Not quite sure why. So... <laughs> That's where it went into slow mo. So Pat Pine will go past this and just, this is just really boring. Literally, you just roll the whole thing round. So I'm sure you've all seen these before. So I think that's it coming off. And boring. Okay, that's the edge I've got, which is quite a good edge. Oh, here we go again. And that's um, on a so grey wheel, isn't it, Shirley? Yeah, it is on a grey wheel. We'll discuss that later, I'm sure. This is the um, the skew attachment I bought separately. So you can't see it too easily on here, but there's a pocket here, a pocket here, and a pocket here. And this bit where the knob is, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, you just literally put that on the pocket that you've already bought. Okay, and then you put the skew in. You start whichever side you want to do first. You put the skew chisel in either the left-hand pocket or the right-hand pocket. So I'll show that now. So that's with it on, just show, showing it attached. So and there's my skew with the bevel rubbing. And there it is in the left-hand pocket, because I'm going to do the left-hand side. I'm going to show you the left-hand side. OK. And there's you have to have the short point of your skew to the, to the left when you're in the left-hand pocket. And when you do the right-hand pocket, you turn it over, and you have the short point then to the right. OK. And this is my skew here. So here we go. I'm only, I'm only going to do one side because the other side is exactly the same. And I'm not doing it freehand like it looks like I am. It is actually in the pocket. That's my husband in the background. Excuse that. He decided to interfere. Bit blurred, but I've got a better picture. I'll take that off. There we go. So that's the edge that I actually got. Not a bad edge, actually. It was razor sharp. Okay, and you can see it better there. That's a much better version. And this I'm going to do. Uh, this is for the uh, bowl gouge. Now, this is my very grind, which is the original very grind, which I'm guessing most people have probably got. Um, and so you put the tool into this bit here, which will show you. And you have to get a um, make up a bowl gouge depth gauge with a piece of wood, which like which works like a bit like a bench hook. So and there it is with the hole. And I can't remember what the depth is off the top of my head. And I know I should have looked, um, but there it is. So you literally just put the, um, the bowl gouge in through your very grind. 
um, and then into the hole until it stops and then you tighten it up. And then you, um, there it is with the bevel on the stone so that you know you've got the, the uh, pocket in the right place. And this is my husband now, he's my apprentice. And he's not done this before, so he did quite well with this, but he's right-handed. I found it quite tricky being left-handed. And what he didn't realise, and I forgot to tell him, was he had to go right over to the left. So I then told him to go right over to the right. Right, right. So. And there we go. So, And that's the edge that I got, or he got, I should say. Bearing in mind, that's the first time he's ever used it. And that's it for me, I'm done. I've been asked to talk briefly about the woodcut true grind system, uh, which I've been using, um, although I have actually migrated uh, uh, recently to a pro edge system, but I still have the true cut and uh, it's still useful for certain aspects of, of grinding. So what I thought I'd do is just to give an overview of what I've got, uh, how it fits in with the rest of the setup in the workshop. I'm using the True Grind in, in association with the Record Power uh, Bench Grinder and the True Grind Woodcut True Grind uh, Jig to position the chisels. So the grinding system really consists of of three parts. Obviously, there's the bench grinder itself, the record power bench grinder in this case. There's a slider here, which moves to accommodate the jig at different positions. And then there's the jig itself, which sits in that cup like that, and is then able to articulate over the wheel with obviously with the chisel mounted mounted in it the position of the slider is pretty important as is the position of the uh, jig each tool has its own particular setting both of the slider and the position on the jig although i have to say that for the majority of tools the slider moves only marginally and the jig uh, probably stays at the same setting. The important thing to do is to ensure that when you present the tool to the wheel, the face that you want to grind is in the right position, in other words, flat against the wheel uh, and, and not at an angle. In terms of cost, uh, the bench grind, this particular model, is about uh, 70 pounds whereas the jig and the slider which come together obviously uh, is almost double that more than double that at 160 pounds those are list prices so there may be deals to be had uh, in it'll be possible to compare those prices and obviously therefore the value with other systems that are going to be demonstrated uh, during this presentation. I mentioned that I'd show how the grinding system is positioned in the workshop in relation to the lathe. So there's the grinding system and just over here is the lathe. As you can see, it has mounted on it a Christmas cracker, which is pretty um, appropriate for this time of year, I think. So that's how it all hangs together here. Um, I also, as I mentioned earlier, do have a pro edge uh, which is his sitting here uh, next to the uh, bandsaw. Okay so I'm now going to mount the spindle gouge, the spindle gouge into the jig and it's important to ensure that it's always the same distance so that's why this block is mounted on the bench and I can ensure that it's always 50 millimeters away like that. Screw it down, throw it up and then the slider here needs to be at 80, which it is. And the jig is on number four, which it is. And then into the cup, on with the wheel, on with the safety specs. And quick grind, one on each side. 
stick one in the middle and job done. Okay, we're now going to try and grind the skew chisel. Um, this gets mounted also in the jig and it gets mounted vertically like that. And we need to check that it's the right distance again, 50 millimeters up to the block. True it down. And the slider for this, uh, this chisel needs to be at 70, which it is. And we just need to check that it's presenting flat against the wheel, which it is. So we can turn the wheel on like that. Quick grind on that side. Quick grind on that side. Being careful to keep it flat always. And job done. Job done. You may be wondering why I have migrated from the true grind on a bench grinder to the Pro Edge. Um, it, it's not a full migration, I've used both, but I found that the uh, true grind is a bit fiddly and I, has, I wasn't able to get a really good edge on that, whereas with the Pro Edge, I was able to, um, and no doubt you will make your own mind up when you've seen Malcolm's presentation. Thank you, Simon. Hi, well, uh, I'm going to do a quick run through of the Sorby Universal. Not like the Wolverine with a big shaft going through it. It's all done in a small little dinky bracket. So it comes in two parts. You've got the bottom section, which takes the same boss system as the Sorby Pro Edge. And that allows you to put your jig system in it and to do your fingernail grinds. And the platen at the top can be fixed onto a separate wheel with a separate frame, um, if you wish, uh, for grinding skews. But the advantage and disadvantage of it all being able to be in one location is it's very compact, but it also makes it a bit fiddly. So uh, in order to actually use the fingernail boss, you need to wind this out of the way, set your tool in the uh, jig. Uh, this particular jig is the actually off the Sorby uh, Pro Edge because it just happens to be the one that I have to hand but the uh, angle at 120 degrees is the same uh, on both systems. I'm setting that with a 40 mil out uh, protrusion. Okay so I'm uh, now setting it into the jig boss and um, the angle of the grind is about 30 or 40 degrees on this. Uh, so I'll just turn it on and give it a quick dust up. So that's the grind that uh, is um, off the uh, Universal. It's um, it's an 80 grit, so it's a bit striated, but not bad. It's about 35 degrees. To sharpen the skew, uh, you either need to make yourself up some uh, template profile so that you can match the angle of the platen to the wheel to a preset or else you use the felt pen trick. Um, now in order to get the universal system to set correctly you have to juggle the adjustment of the height of the platen and the angle and you have to do them at the same time because 
it has to clear the wheel and you have to have it at the right height to allow the uh, tool to sit properly. It's extremely fiddly and drives me up the wall. So one of the challenges is that the height and the angle both need adjusting for each, each tool. And these flipping captive doodads. Uh, so you can't, I don't think, just set the, the height and adjust the angle. Um, if you could, that would be easy. But that is a 25 degree, and that's about in the right position. So I go back to the skew uh, that was at 15 degree. If it was just the angle that needed adjusting, then I could just slacken this off. But you can't, you can't, because what happens is, is that the base of the frame hits the body of the bracket. So in order to tilt that back more, you have to lift it. So with the horrors of sharpening the skew behind me, I thought I'd uh, disassemble the system and have a quick go at some hand sharpening. I don't do this very often, uh, but having watched Gary Rance do it, I realised that the art with uh, grinding the bevel on the gouge is to run the tool up and down the wheel. And that just allows you to rotate it and grind the flute all the way around. It's not that hard to do, it's just that you don't get a repeatable grind, or at least I don't. So there we have it, probably the quickest way of doing a grind. Uh, it's not pretty, uh, but, but you uh, get a good edge if you do it carefully. So why not? Save a load of money. It's Viv now on the uh, on the Tormex system. Uh, oh, somebody asked me, am I running my presentation through OBS and Zoom? Yes, I am. It's this is OBS uh, and into Zoom. That's, no, for me that's all right. Okay. Okay. Well, there's a picture of it. Um, the as as uh, my, uh, Michael pointed out right at the beginning, that the, the basis of it is this this horizontal bar here, which is as you can see is also on the um, universal um, ultimate edge so that you can use these jigs or the platform. Um, this, uh, this wheel here is quite impressive and uh, one of the videos later shows how it's the only precision um, piece of adjustment you can do. Um, I don't know, see what people think, but I, I use these cheap diamond files to, to um, clean it up. I don't know if that, there may well be opinions on that, but I find it cleans it up quite nicely. Um, so um, the um, support bar is available as uh, for, for a bench grinder. So I've got it here mounted by my CBN wheel. Um, so you can basically do your, reshape your tool on the CBN and then finish it off on the, on the tool mech without changing the, um, setting on the jig. Um, I would just just, uh, just point out um, that I think it's total bullshit that the CBN wheel doesn't heat up the tool. It does, just as much as anything else does, it seems to me. So I, so I don't quench, so I go away and have a cup of coffee, come back and do it again when it's, you know, when it's cooled down. Um, but that's, so that's the BGM 100 and it costs pretty much the same as you'd expect think of a number and double it. Um, this uh, link I put at the top of the chat and it's a, a one hour um, Tormek um, thing on YouTube to, um, to, tell you, um, to tell you to buy Tormek and use the diamond wheel, etc. But it's it very, very, uh, very useful stuff. Um, and this is my little bit, bit of jiggery papery to use the very grind. Um, without because you can't put the wolverine under here um and the um what did you call it wibbly wobbly um <laughs> gouge gouge tool yeah. um 
the sleeve is too long for it to go far enough to the left on the um, uh, to, for a Celtic grind. So if you want a Celtic grind, then I use the I use the Wolverine on that uh, homemade. Uh, sorry, I'm pointing at it with my finger uh, on that homemade um, pocket there, uh, and use this spacing uh, piece of cut piece of uh, plywood to space it for different tools, and then check with the marker method. Um, now I think there's a video here, so. Um, yes, just a quick one. Um, this is basically how to how to adjust the um, turn the sound down. This is how to uh, how to use that little wheel to find fine tune the distance, and so so you start with the support bar a little closer to the wheel than it should be. And then use the little wheel to push push it out. And when both actually, I put some felt tip on those wheels so you can see it turning in the uh, on the video. And then just uh, um, so you see how long that sleeve is. Um, so with a Celtic grind, it just doesn't go far enough to the left. But it's fine for a spindle gouge or something like that, so I tend to use it for that. It's on a different setting with a spindle spindle gouge anyway, so it's good to have the two different jigs uh, for different tools because then you don't have to keep changing the changing the setting. So that's the uh, that's the edge. Um, that's a Filofax ruler, so that's one millimeter between the between the, the lines. So it's a different scale from the others, but I thought I would, I would try out my new microscope. Um, the only thing about that that I notice is there's this, this yellowing here. And I'm wondering whether that's just a reminder that you need to be very careful to dry your tool thoroughly after it's been on the water wheel. Right, so here is the skew jig. And what I've done, maybe it's a little bit, um, and turn the sound down again. Um, is a little bit ambitious, but I wanted to show how this this jig can go wrong. It's a bit of a. It takes about both of them took me about three minutes to set to set up. Um, and I'm doing a radius edge on this, but you see what it's leaning on and what it's pivoting on, just the corner of the thing that which you can't see through my hand. So if you go too far up, too far to the, if you like, to, to, the, to the toe of the skew, then yeah, it falls off. And so that's something you really have to watch for. So I thought I would show you that. Um, and that is the edge. Um, which as you can see here, you can't see that with the naked eye, but you can see that it, there's a little bit of damage there. And I think that may be well from when, from when it fell off. Um, that's basically it. It's sort of, I'm afraid it's, um, yeah, and that's it. <laughs> there we go. Done, well done, Viv, that's great. Do, do you know what the, um, uh, the wheel uh, grit is? I know that you can have it at one, grit and then you can roughen it but what do you know what your grit is on that wheel um i don't actually i mean i think the thing is that it probably depends on the on the diamond file you use that, that stone grader thing i didn't get on with at all um so i gave it away um oh, that sort of double-sided stone um yeah. yeah that's what i was talking about yeah yeah um um um, the thing is, it, it, also because it rotates so very slowly, you can see how much more slowly it rotates. Um, you're going to take ages to, to get any reshape on it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether there are any other... I, I do use it. It's the first system I got. Um, and, I, and I do use it sort of um, for, for, most, for most things. I use the, um, the platform. Hmm. So Justin, do you know what grit your uh, your wheels at? Um, not without looking in the book. Um, again, I do use the 
the finer side of the stone. I very rarely reprofile any of my gouges or anything. I'm, as you know, we've discussed this before, very lazy when it comes to sharpening. So I kind of stick with the basic settings that I started sharpening the, the tools with when I first got them. And I'm managing to sort of cope with that. But I did regrade... I did regrade it at the very beginning, used the coarse side of the stone, redressed it, um, reprofiled a, a gouge, and then redressed the stone again with the finer side. And it certainly does make a difference. And then, of course, you've got the honing wheel. Barry's got his hand up. I have got a diamond tea bar which is... You put the tool rest almost touching the... Well, you have to put it on the top. A bit like because, that, Harry. That's the chap. That's the boy. Yeah, very, very good. And uh, But you have to put it on the top, of the, 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 um, the bar on the top. Otherwise, it's... Because the, the wheel goes away from you. Otherwise, it's always lifting it up. Oh, yeah. So it's, mm. it's, it's pushing it back against the wheel, uh, the, 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 the rest. Um, and I find that... I don't use it a lot, but sometimes you just need to redress it. Mm. Okay. Phil Skoltok here. He says, for anyone with a bench grinder system, with or without a Wolverine, Ro Robbo Hippie does a good um, indexable flat platform. He's shutting his business down and offering 33% discount, but you may have to pay shipping. So I'm guessing, is he from America? He is. Yeah. Very nice gentleman as well. Uh-huh. And also, uh, there's something here from Matt Petch says, I regularly dress the wheel with the stone grader rough side, then dress with the fine side to finish. Um, and apparently, it's like, like saying, we're not so well off in Lincolnshire, just just rub the, just rub the gouge up and down the brickwork. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> this I, works well and keeps nice. it flat. <laughs> I, I have to say, nobody disparaged my 30 seconds of hand sharpening. So, uh, you know, um, we'll uh, see what people think about that after. But firstly, I'll look at grinding skews using the platen, which can be set at different angles. The table at the front, which is stuck on, shows you the uh, angles that you can adjust the platen to using the preset holes that are in the frame on the side. By slackening off the locking bolt and adjusting the angle, the pin goes into one of the holes on the side wherever you want it to, and this is adjusting it to 15 degrees for the skew. It's a matter of seconds to get it to set to a guaranteed angle, which is repeatable every time. One of the jigs that you get with the system uh, fits in the little sliding uh, notch in the platen, and it's set so that if you've got a skew that is ground to exactly the 20 degree rate at the top that the Sorby skews are when they're supplied, then you can just ride it on the side of the jig and it'll exactly give you the angle at the top. Now I tend to grind mine by hand and don't bother with that so I just uh, put it on the platen and um, because it's exactly set to the right angle it's just by eye as to how that rake at the top is um, going to come out. Just those couple of seconds on the 120 belt gives you a razor sharp edge. The knack with all these things is getting the angle just right. It's quite easy for the body of the motor to clonk the handle and at 15 degrees it's the most difficult one to get right. That's why this is set back at about 30 degrees at that angle then this does not get in the way. So now I'm just going to grind a bowl gouge. Um, this one I've measured it on here I've got it set to 60 degrees I'll etch that on with a engraving tool. So 60 degrees is my, my protrusion, which is about 45 mil. Being a type bod, I nicked the dimensions of the pro set, as they call it, and made my own out of a block of wood. 
Hey, why not? Let's recheck. So I'm going to hand. Right, so that's now set to 45 mil protrusion. Uh, I'm going to stick it in the longest one, which means that this front angle is closer to about 70 degrees. And um, So that is now razor sharp and that is a long grind uh, which I usually grind the back of the heel out by hand which I do manually. So the heel is quite significantly ground out by hand and you've got quite a nice mirrory sort of shine, there's a few striations on it because it is a 120 grit that's quite a good bowl gouge grind uh, Any questions far away while I fly? Yeah, there was one from Matt, he said can Viv get your hand sharpening on the microscope? <laughs> um that would be quite an interesting thing, though, to try and get them all on um, the microscope. It would. It's a great idea, actually, um, because yeah. then it would give us a proper technical doodad. Um, it would, indeed. There's nothing like a technical doodad after you've done a wobbly, flappy thing. <laughs> five, five minutes. Five minutes. Right, what I'm going to try and show now is how you have to try and adjust this to set to a particular angle using... Uh, another template I've made for 25 degrees in this case. So you've got to somehow manage to adjust the distance in and out at the same time as you're adjusting the angle. <coughs> so you do need three pairs of hands. So you've got to fiddle with this to get this to go in and out. same time just trying to get the angle right so that's about the right distance in and out and of course you need to do this on the fly quickly whilst you're wood turning so that you don't have to mess about not something I can see happening well first problem I've got is the tool rest is too long for the tool to meet there so that's a complete fail as well I'm not bothering with any other jigs to try and set anything up at square. There's a nice strike line down here. So. so that one worked. So I then moved on to a 15 degree skew. And you can set that up the same as before with a template. But because the skew has got about a 20 degree uh, grind across the top, I found that the uh, body and handle of the tool clonked the motor housing, and there was absolutely no way that I could get the bevel in contact and have it miss the housing. If you lifted the bevel up off the belt to about 20 or so degrees, then if I'd reset it, I could have probably missed the motor housing. But at 15 degrees, no way. Right, one last mm. second. And now reset with another 45 degree template so I can do a spindle roughing gouge. So that's 45 degrees. I'm hoping I'll just <coughs> roll my tool on there very easily. I know that it's working, albeit that I'm not using the jigs that they recommend. Right, I'm now going to sharpen a um, spindle roughing gouge using the uh, Tormek um, recommended jig system. I've set this to the recommended three inch distance out protrusion. Uh, this works just by pushing it, there's no lock, so it's just pushing it and then 
rolling it using the bar as a guide. But at three inches and 33 mil seems to work about right. Right, I've just put a 60 grade belt on here and uh, I've set the distance to 33 millimeters. Uh, sorry, not 33. 24 millimeters, which is the distance I had ascertained when I had a previous go. I've uh, just going to mark up, check that I've got the right angle. So put that on here. That's fine. That's the right angle. Well, that's given it quite a nice grind off the 60 grit. That is successful. This moves quite nicely round. It doesn't clout if you set it up right. This is going to be quite easy to repeat. But when you go to put the uh, side panel back on, I couldn't understand why there were uh, there was a washer with this um, for the butterfly grip, butterfly um, wing nut. But when you put this on, if you don't actually put the spacer in, then the panel rubs against the side shaft. Um, the nut, the spacer needs to be easy to fit on. This is something you want to do in one or two seconds. You don't want this to be difficult because as soon as it's difficult, you won't change belts. And then somehow you've got to figure out how to get this on. It's not glued, it's not welded. I just dropped it. So at this point, this would probably be going out the window. Hmm. <coughs> hmm. Interesting, eh? Hmm, very. Yeah. Uh, what uh, what they've done is they've combined the flexibility of, ha of having an in and out movement on the bar, like you got on the Tormek, uh, with the nominal speed and ease of the Pro Edge. But they've just got the design wrong. Uh, and mm. uh, the, I, I sketched things up. I even made them some templates and said, you know, just don't get this out there to everybody till you've, uh, you know, had a go mm. at this it's fairly easy to figure out what the differences are the little scribe um, uh, dimensions on the side are too short you can't actually have a measurement for every setting because you run off the scale uh, it's just wrong um, and I don't understand why right can you see that yeah right it's now a pdf so thank you Phil for the suggestion I, I, I couldn't figure out quickly how to do the other version so Roger in the beginning are you still there, Roger? I'm I'm still here. I can't go away. Well, you've got to tell me what to do. It's your presentation. Do you want me to stay on that screen or? Well, I just thought this would, you know, set the scene so we know that these things that we've got now are, are modern, but the whole technology is very, very old. Anyway, next one. My um, sharpening started back in 1957. And in those days, the machine you see there is the kind of thing we had in the woodworking class for sharpening chisels and plain irons. Luckily, things moved on a little bit. So up, up and off. Next one, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I joined the Air Force in 60 and in 64 got posted to RAF Bordsey, home of radar, and I was lucky enough to go into the um, camp hobbies room one day and discover they've got an ML8 lathe. 
And I thought, oh, I'd like to have a go at that. And after a couple of trips into the hobbies room, I gave up because there was nobody on the camp who knew how to use it and work it. And so, therefore, I had to wait a little time before I could get a lathe. Next one. Thank you. Hold on. It's just a... Uh, sorry, my small keyboard decided to go to sleep. We now come to the formative years. 64, I got married. And with married life, you get DIY. And you need to sharpen chisels, plain irons, garden shears, knives, you name it. And those, the um, iron, the, sorry, the Eclipse 36 gauge um, clamp there and the stone are the ones that I had originally and I still got. And they still work. Um, but like all men, we always look for an improvement. And so... Up to the next one. That was an improvement in your sharpening or in your married life, mate? Which was that? No, that was an improvement in the sharpening. Thank you. Then I had a midlife crisis. I, on my 55th birthday, I went to a woodworking show in Birmingham looking to buy a saw table. I won a Triton Super Jaws. And the next thing I knew... My business had gone from microcomputer board software and building computer enclosures to importing American-made tools. And so, in 1998, I finally got to take up wood turning. Um, I got a Time Cub lathe with a lot of Henry Taylor tools and decided that a course would be a good idea and I went off to craft supplies in Millerdale and had a weekend course and when you in those days when you went to the um, craft supplies you got a 15% discount on any tools you decided to buy and so I bought myself a Draper dual wheel uh, basic grinder Similar to the one shown there, but not as good. And I still got that. And then I decided to sell the Tormex system as a line for the company to sell. And it was a nice product. Um, but when you're selling Tormex, so is everybody else. And that is not the way I ran my business. I like to like to have exclusive lines or at least no more than two competitors. Right, next one, please, Melvin. So I dropped the Tormek and got involved with Wood Artistry with their lap sharp. Now, this uses 3M materials for the sharpening and polishing. The bad news is it's no longer manufactured. Um, there's a little video there if Malcolm wants to try running it, which will give you an idea of what the machine is like. Okay, um, give it a go. You, with, my, with my luck, it probably won't work. I think we should get through it if, if that's all right. Right, okay. We'll leave that for the moment. Um, it's basically like a record player. Disc goes around at 140, 150 RPM. And you can set the angles um, very accurately. But if in today's market, it would sell for around a grand with all the jigs and fixtures. But, and you could sharpen on that um, any tool, even big planar blades. Um, it's a beautiful product. And... I enjoyed, I sold a few, because there are not many rich people. Most of them were in the South, nobody in Lincolnshire that I can remember. <laughs> then 2008, I think it was around about 2008, I added the dual tool sharpening system. 
again, this uses 3M material, but what is different about this is you sharpen the tool on the underside of the wheel and the wheel has got um, segments chopped out of it so you can see exactly what's happening to the um, tool being sharpened. It's a brilliant idea. And just going back to the um, lap sharp, there is a company in the States who make, came out with a machine that worked on the lap sharp approach, but incorporated this dual tool um, disc type system, but on a larger scale. And they came out with a machine called a WS3000. They still make it in the States, but they don't sell it over here, they told me this week. Um, they couldn't get the sales for it. The lady who sells the jewel tool, she does some work into the woodworking market, but her prime market is jewellery and stuff like that. She's a beautiful looking lady. And I was talking to Clive Brooks at Sorby this week, and I said to him, had he seen the jewel tool? He said, yeah. He said, whenever he's doing a show in the States, he always watches this lady, Annie. He said, because she really knows her product and she's good looking. And he said, on one occasion, he talked to a gentleman who'd gone up and bought the stuff. And he said to him, well, what do you think of it? He said, I don't know what I bought. <laughs> <laughs> it just shows that, uh, you know, looks can sell. But they're both good products and they've got their place. I use the jewel tool for cleaning stuff up and tools and stuff and also for carving gouges. Next one. Retirement. I join the uh, um, people that have added their um, Pro Edge. I love this machine. It is good. It does the job. I think its major benefit is it's quick. Um, I have done some grinding. I tend to sharpen, not grind. I don't see the need. And by the way, Shirley, yes, looks can sell. Um, and that young lady, I think she was getting married. Yeah, funny to, that. To a woodworker, a wood turner. Yeah, you see. Yeah. Anyway, um, my lineup of grinding equipment, uh, well, sharpening equipment, is I've got the, still got the draper, still got the lap sharp, still got the jewel tool, and the Sorby Pro Edge. And then I've got a number of hand hones in CBM and diamond. I actually used the diamond ones this morning on the sharp shears for my wife. You know, I've got to make sure that life is easy for her. Anyway, next one. Here's what I would do if I was going to start out again now. Um, I'd buy a Sorby. And then for doing the um, chisels and plane irons and stuff, which I need and use quite regularly, I would buy the Veritas Honing Guide along with a scary sharp. Um, sharpening system and if you haven't ever looked or heard of the hep scary sharp excuse me I suggest you go and have a, a look on the woodworkers workshop um, or on the YouTube it's a brilliant way of sharpening wood turn woodworking tools not wood turning but woodworking tools really it is scary sharp Next one. Yeah, I'm sorry again. I don't think I can actually trust myself to fire up the uh, that that video link. Um, right there, I found this one. If you want to make your own tools, um, he's made his whole lathe in, out of plywood as well. Yeah. As the... um, there's a number of people out there on YouTube who build everything in wood. Um, it's not my idea of um, engineering. 
Um, one final thing I was going to say is um, a lot of people follow Norm Abram in the States and have done, you know, he's the guru for woodworking and that. Well, this is my favourite guru, young Kenny Everett Reg Prescott. Hello uh, DIY buffs, Reg Prescott here with some more helpful DIY tips for all DIY freaks out there in DIY land. I've just been down the workshop and um, I picked up my, there you go, my workshop WS3000. Oh, so there is one in the country. There is yeah. one in the country. What's mm -hmm. going to be a worry is getting the bits and pieces for it. It's a cracking bit of quit. I, I mean, I do all my... Um, planer blades and, and chisels in it you offer them up into this slot into the, here yeah. which is adjustable width and then it just catches the grit on the bottom of the removable disc here um which is uh, the discs are mounted on a on a, on a glass plate here's here's yeah. one and uh so you can change from through four grits uh well you know in a matter of seconds yeah. Also, this is adjustable, so you can uh, alter your bevel just at the click of a, of a bit here. It's an absolutely cracking bit of kit. Well, once once they're worn out, though, uh, Richard, can you can yeah, you still purchase them, or or, or do you? Uh, or, or can you well, they have these discs on it, which are self adhesive. So, um, okay, uh, I, I don't know. I hadn't appreciated that they were no longer available in this country, but uh, well, the machine is not available. Ah. Uh, but I expect they'll be able to get the discs and that. It's one of the discs is is this yeah. baby. That's the one. And so yeah. that goes on upside down. And you offer the, uh, the the blade or something to the underneath of it. And because of the holes in it and the light yeah. oscillating, you can see exactly what's going on. Yeah. Mm. So that's it, folks. The results are in. 16 votes for the Pro Edge, and the next was the Wolverine or Copy, and Tormac with four. True Rhyme, but only with one. Resounding success for the Pro Edge.